Shut up and sit down. Welcome to Stew in the Nut, an online radio show and podcast focused on national security, policy, politics, and selfless service. We're here to give you an honest opinion, a different perspective, and hopefully a few laughs. We do this by not only interviewing guests, but also sharing our own perspectives and asking you, the listener, to interact with us on the show chat room, via our Facebook page, and on Twitter. We would like to thank those who make this show possible and allow us to bring it to you. Our show sponsors, Warrior Media Solutions, BlueHammer.com, Mighty Oaks Warrior Foundation, Graybeard Publishing, and of course, Sheepdog Response. We would also like to recognize some of our favorite nonprofit charities who are doing great things for those who have served this country of ours. Veterans Outdoors, Mighty Oaks Warrior Foundation, PinupsForVets.com, and the Lauren F. Bruner USS Arizona Memorial Foundation. To learn more about these nonprofits and how you can donate to their awesome causes, visit our website at www.stewinthenun.com. And there we go, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Stew and the Nun. We are glad for you to join us here on this February 27th. Toby, the last February of the year already. Can you believe it? it? It is the last February of the year. I mean, if, if only February happened more than once, but it doesn't. And uh, this year we actually get an extra day of February because leap year. It is a long, but, it's uh, a long month this month. That's right. That's true. It's breaking me off already. It's breaking me off. Uh, you know, like motorcycle weather one day and bring your plants inside the next day. Uh, if only she potted them in smaller pots. Yeah, well, there there is that. Um, I, I don't have much. I don't have any sympathy for you, as uh, we've been in under blizzard watch in the northern studio here since last night. And uh, just a couple hours ago, I was out there snow blowing, uh, trying to get about ten inches of snow being wind blown at twenty miles an hour off my driveway and off my cars. And I was thinking, well, I bet Toby's really nice and uh, warm down there in the southern studio. And glad he does not live Man, in the I north. Almost had to put a jacket on. Dude. Hit you, hit you. Man, <laughs> the struggle. Yeah, that's it. But it's, uh, real. it's real. Yep. Well, everybody, then again, thank you for joining us here on this Thursday night, February twenty seventh, episode one ninety three, I believe. And uh, we are um, coming to you again, sponsored by two of our great sponsors, Enlisted Nine Fight Company, uh, Veteran Outdoors, and uh, can't for, can't forget Gear for Grunt, sporting a Gear for Grunt shirt tonight uh, for Doug. And uh, kind of give him some props. Sporting uh, the matching blue VO uh, camo uh, cryptic uh, VO hat to go with it because you know you taught me ta- you taught me how to dress, Toby. I mean, obviously, I mean you're you're wearing the uh, you're welcome. You're also in blue tonight. It's almost like we coordinated this, and I think our guests too. We were kind of did we oh. we planned all this tonight? I think we are matching. <clears throat> My wife would be so proud of me. There's a secret chat that we have that tells us what to wear. That's right, but uh, but we got a great show. Yep, go ahead. We got one of my favorite people on earth uh, for the sheer purpose of, like, she's Texan. So anytime you have a Texan on the show, uh, you know you're in the best of company. Not only uh, is she Texan, she is a veteran. She's an educator. She has got double lambs. You know, like, when you say... Your name has double letters. I have triple letters because I got the N, the U, and then the double N. But anytime you got double M's as your initials, you're in good company. M and M's created for the purpose of the military to bring joy and good morale across the world. Uh, there might have been a president involved in that. It might have been an executive order. But tonight, for your listening pleasure, we have Melissa. She was supposed to be on a couple weeks ago. Unfortunately, uh, the Bush Leagueness of uh, my technical ability versus your technical ability uh, was evident, and we were unable to bring her on. She's the most patient woman, <laughs> definitely an educator, because uh, she sat and dealt with uh, Rob, uh, the unpaid producer, and myself 
for about 45 to 50 minutes trying to un uh what's the word i'm looking for that's not vulgar <laughs> uh, unwrap the technical <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, undo the mess that i'd created uh but yeah so without further ado we got melissa coming on uh super excited to have her on and uh we, we're talking about education i'm very focused on education right now um i'm you know working on a one of my my best friends uh campaign for school board uh here in georgetown so like i'm excited to talk to an educator education is a very important part of my life obviously because i got kids you know and i want them to to do well and so without further ado are you ready to do this yeah right. melissa welcome welcome to the stew and the nun show thank you for coming back with us oh well thank you for inviting yep yep no problem and uh yeah i you know some people have worked – we've had people work with Toby and I in the past quite a bit, and they kind of refer to us as still as being kids. I don't know what grade you've taught, uh, but um, I'm sure but through, through your years of experience, it probably was nothing new to have to deal with us. So uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I won't throw spitballs at Toby, and um, and I'm sure – and I'm sure he won't try to do anything to me, but he may drop a bad word every once in a while. But again, thank you so much. Uh, as Toby said, you're in Texas. You are an educator, but you're also uh, you are an Air Force veteran. You have raised your right hand and, uh, and swore to defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes and kind of just giving yourself an in, you know an intro, kind of your background to our viewers and listeners, and kind of uh, you know kind of where you've come from and, and that kind of stuff, and, and where you are today, that'd be great to get us started. Okay. Well, um, I, I am a veteran. I was actually a diesel mechanic in the Air Force. Um, and um, that was a, a wonderful experience for me. I encourage all of my students who uh, think about going into the military to do so. But one of the, the huge blessings is obviously I got to travel, but I've never had to pay for any of my schooling. And um, you know, I have a master's degree in education administration, and I've, I've never had to take out a loan. And that's been a huge blessing. Um, one of the outcomes of serving our country. But um, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I think I was maybe in third grade when I started talking about it. And my mom tried to sort of talk me out of it, but she figured out pretty quick that it was pointless because I was stubborn. So she went ahead and just supported my efforts. And when I got out of the military, I went ahead and got my degree, and I've been teaching ever since. So that's... Uh, this, I'm actually in my fourth school district, so I've taught in a variety of districts here in the state of Texas, from small rural districts to more inner city to suburban, and I'm in a suburban district now, and I'll tell you, I love where I am now, and, and I loved where I was in all the schools where I've taught, but I feel like I've truly found home where I am now. I love it. You know, I'm Melissa, you bring up a very interesting point. I, I was having this conversation with a, a, a group of, of fathers, you know, recently. And we're, and we're talking about, like, the benefit of, you know, the military in terms of coming out like, educated with opportunity and being debt-free. Uh, you know, like, I, I wish uh, I could get my kids into certain academies. I, I believe that, you know, some will uh, have that opportunity, you know, because one, the military, whether you're in an academy, whether you're enlisted, you're taking advantage of the GI Bill, be it, you know, like in Texas with the Hazelwood Act, which is an amazing uh, piece of legislation, but you have the opportunity to get educated, some of the best education in the world, you know, be it like post-secondary education or trade school education, and be debt-free. Uh, a wonderful leg up, which, you know, when we look at this election cycle, a big thing that's being talked about is uh, student debt. But a little bit of initiative, you know, the instigation of the appropriate action without the presence of direction, initiative can put a child uh, in a wonderful opportunity to enter the workplace, enter society uh, with a leg up by by being involved in the military. I myself, I came from another country, and uh, you know I wanted to be educated. The reason I came to this country is because I knew anyone that is inside the the borders, the geographical borders of America that wants to get educated can, if they really want to. 
you know, and the the challenge for me was, you know, to get into the get into the geographical borders, which was done legally. Uh, uh, you know, let the record reflect. Uh, but <laughs> you know, anyone that wants to be educated in America can and get one of the best educations in the world. Uh, now, if you manage that appropriately, you can do it by being being debt free, and you know your service to this country, my service to the country. That's how I got my education. That's how Troy got his. You know, like we were able to do what we do based on our efforts and based on our potential. And the military is this wonderful organization that provides opportunity based on a potential not just performance or past performance. Um, so I really would love uh, for you to like share the value of how you, so what level of education do you teach? I know this, but like, let's let the, the audience know. Okay, well, I'm a high school teacher and the campus yeah. where I, I have 10, 11 and 12th graders, um, I'm a what's called a CTE teacher. So I teach the career and, te um, career and technical education. And the courses that I teach are money matters about personal finance. And then I also teach a counseling and mental health class. So I have all three grades in my, in my class. So this is like, this is the catch basin for who we need to like, and, and talked about you, the CTE, the, the, what those letters mean, you know, like, some some kids are destined for college, you know. Some kids are like that's where they need to go, and some kids are destined, you know, like to take their talents. I got. I'm gonna share a story. Do we have time for a rabbit hole, Troy? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we got time. You no, know, like the, the, one of the most amazing things happened to me uh, on Monday morning. Uh, I'm I'm on a VO trip, a veteran outdoors trip. We're traveling. We're taking this uh, this wonderful veteran a very deserving veteran on a dream outdoor adventure to go after uh, wild sheep uh, down near the, the border of Mexico, uh, near Del Rio on the Pecos River. Uh, we have a Polaris on, on our trailer. Our trailer tires are a little bit low and uh, we stop uh, in junction uh, to gas up the vehicle as well as to like get, put a little air in the tires. And you know, if you've ever tried to put air in your tires at a gas station, you got a little compressor thing going, right? And uh, nowadays they're super high tech and they <laughs> want you to pay for an air compressor with a credit card versus just putting like the quarters in, you know, like, cause you know, we need a credit card transaction for $1.25 versus just pulling five quarters out of your pocket. But as I'm trying to do that and I'm like struggling and fumbling, you know, with this air compressor, service truck with this contraption on a trailer in the back pulls up next to me this family spills out mom daughter son they obviously run to the rest stop uh truck stop you know bathroom get sodas whatever they go to do the father's like hey would you like to use a real air compressor and i was like uh boy howdy would i and you know he whips this air compressor off the side of his truck and he like gets our tires squared away and like and and I'm looking at the contraption on this trailer and I'm like, what is that? He's like, oh, that's uh, my son's stock show 4-H project that we just showed at the San Antonio uh, stock thing. I'm like, and, and this is the most industrial contraption you can imagine. It's got signal lights, it's got a robotic arm, it's got hydraulics. I'm like, oh, like you made this for your son? And he was like, no, 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 my son designed and built it, invented it. And it was to test a uh, grain sample. So this robotic arm would swing out, a semi would pull underneath it with a grain truck. This hose would go in, suck grain out of it, uh, send the grain via hose vacuum system into like the, the office space, the waste scale place, agricultural inspection space. They would do a grain sample. They do the quick little testing and, you know, they'd, whether or not the grain was good or blah, 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 blah. All these things I don't know. The bottom line of what I'm saying is this 14-year-old kid uh, used CAD, designed a, vented and designed a thing, welded it, machined it, put the hydraulics, the electrical, then painted it, assembled it. This kid ended up getting like $60,000 in scholarships because he won that show, as he should. 
and I've never felt more inadequate because I'm 44 years old. He was 14. He's got 30 years on me, and I could barely like blow up my tires. But some kids, some individuals, are so talented and gifted in so many different ways. Technically, like that's where we need them. Like that's America's in good hands if we nurture that talent. If we we capture it, and where we need to capture it is at this very age group. You know, like. There was a big pressure for me to like go to college when I was in high school. You know, one because I, uh, you know, I came from Canada. Not everyone graduated. A lot of people went and cut down trees, worked in the sawmills, drove logging trucks, played professional hockey. Like there was like the need to go to high, uh, graduate high school wasn't high. The need to go on the secondary was limited. But I felt this tremendous pressure for me to go to college because if not. I was going to suck at life. And, you know, some kids need to go there. I needed to go there. You know, what I needed to learn, I could only get in that post-secondary education. Some kids, you know, needed to get it in other places. And that's why we have these programs, the CTE stuff. So the, let, me, uh, let, me, let me jump in real quick, Toby. Melissa, is that, you're working in this, is not necessarily the academia side of the school. I mean, you are, but you're in the CTE section. Um, are, are you talking to students about they have these options? It's not just about going to school and racking up hundreds of thousands of, of, of college debt, that there are other options out there to make a, have a good life? And well, I, I can encourage taking out any loans. I tell students all the time that if people are telling them to take out loans, then you know, they just say, okay, thanks for the advice, and then you, you know, go the other direction. Um, you know, Like I said, I encourage students that have a desire at all to go into the military to do that. Um, because a lot mm. of our students don't even know what they want to do. But I also encourage them to make sure if they can't afford it, if their parents haven't saved up for them to go to a university, then go ahead and start at one of the community colleges because, you know, there's no reason why they need to go off to a, a four-year university. And I'm very blunt with students when they say things like, oh, I want to go to Florida or out of state to go to a university. I just ask them why. What What's the purpose in that, you know, and and why would you want to pay out-of-state tuition? I have real conversations with kids. I tend to be pretty blunt with them, and they seem to appreciate that. But one one of the things about college that just frustrates me is, you know, there's so many jobs that people have been able to do for a long time without colleges putting their finger in the pie. For instance, my husband's an operator at a chemical plant, and when he first started doing that as a process technician, they didn't have to have a college degree. Well. So the local community colleges, you know, decided that they needed to have a part of that. And so now if you want to be a process technician, then what you have to do is actually go to one of the local colleges and get a two-year degree. And what's interesting about that is once they've done that and they've been trained out at those schools, well, then, then when they get to one of the plants, they have to get on the job training there anyway because the reactors are all different depending on what, what the plant's like. So it just frustrates me a little bit to see that colleges, they're just a business. And, you know, it's its not kind to make every student think that they have to go to college in order to be successful because some of our students, you know, they, they can't pass the TSI. And so they have to take a whole bunch of, of prep classes that they don't actually get a credit for. And they're just giving the, the schools money. It's um, the whole thing is just kind of a racket, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, and, when you look at, when you look at the vocational skills that, you know, people, you know, they go to college, they get the business degree to get this and that for four years. And then, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen where you look at people that learn something like welding, uh, air conditioned refrigeration, plumbing, things like that. They can, you know, whether they go to a BOCES or Votech school or something, or just learn it from home from, from, you know, relatives, uh, they can walk right into, you know, starting out a, a 15, 18, 20, $25 an hour job. Right. And, and not have mountains of debt and be really well, good at it they can get prepared for in high school and get certifications. We've got all kinds of programs where they can do that, whether it's through you know, medical, they can get like pharmacy tech. There's, there's really all kinds of programs at the high school level where kids can get employability skills and, and not have to go to college and you know, break their families. So that, yeah. Right. Right. Now, um, just interesting. I mean, it's, uh, one thing we see, I know one thing turning a lot of people away from, from higher education is that, you know, there's this, 
there's this, the, and it's not, I can't say it's a stereotype because it's just too common, but there's this, this mantra of, you know, send your kids off to college and they're going to get brainwashed, you know, to think one way in our world and be, you know, the, the, the academia world and higher education is ultra liberal. We see it all the time. It's not something I'm making up. I mean, there's fact after fact, uh, you know, we, we see where students that are in young Republicans groups or something get, get attacked. Uh, we know what the professors are out there saying. Um, I've had, you know, I'm on the last of several boys and my other ones have all went to college and, you know, uh, they've, you know, I've heard it from what they tell me, the, the, the professors say, they've all seen it in high school. I mean, every one of them, the high school teachers for the most part are not much different. Um, I'm sure you see the same thing down there. I can't imagine it's much different, even though it's Texas, that uh, there's got to be a, a heavy slant and, and people bring in politics into the classroom. Well, certainly it's university level and, you know, even at the community college level, the higher education is very liberal. And what I have, when I, when I talk to students that are at the university, the ones that maintain their own personal values, um, they just have to be quiet about it because they're concerned that it could affect their grade um, or they get shamed about it. But there are a lot of students that maintain their, their values um, and they just, Know, kind of have to tough it out and push through but they certainly do get challenged at so, the university level so it's not any different than what we see in society today right we, we see this one side that that is has no problem touting their values and pushing their beliefs on people and the other side that just stays quiet and cast their vote right and it's really a, a micro view of that down to the to, down to the high school level sounds like oh absolutely but you know like um the the new organization that we were talking about the innovative teachers of texas so one of the reasons that that group got formed was because there really are a lot of teachers in the state of Texas that want to preserve traditional Texas values, but we tend to be politely quiet. And like you said, we just show up and vote um, and, and we kind of keep our, our um, attitudes and our thoughts and our values to ourselves. And we've allowed progressives to infiltrate the system and um, they've kind of created a mess. So that's one of the reasons that this group was formed so that it would give a voice to the teachers that really want to preserve those traditional Texas values. And, so that, that, and that's the innovative uh, teachers of Texas group. And that's just in Texas. It's a, it's a local, is it across multiple schools in Texas or, are there, or is it just in your school district? No, it's, it's across multiple. Uh, membership has been building. Um, we had a, a membership drive this year and the, um, we have a goal that we're trying to get to, but we did finally get the liability insurance provided. So as of June 1st, um, that's, that's one of the things that when teachers join different organizations, we can't call them unions here in Texas because we're not allowed to have teacher unions, but there are teacher organizations that are here. And when teachers join those organizations, they usually do it so that they have the liability insurance so that professionally, they have the, the legal assistance if they need that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is when they join those organizations, a lot of those take some of the dues that you pay and they give it to some things that don't go along with our values. Um, for instance, um, there's an organization here in Texas that gives to another organization that's nationwide and they actually contribute to Planned Parenthood. Well, a lot of us don't really um, agree with that. Um, actually, there's a whole lot of us that don't agree with that, but we have felt kind of stuck because it's important in our profession to have that liability insurance. So that was one of the huge reasons that this organization was formed. And have you seen any, has, has anyone seen any pushback or comments or anything from administration, from people that feel different in the administration? Because I know for teachers, a lot of it's, it's dealing with the administration is some of the biggest challenges. You know, I mean, nobody, nobody that I know of has gotten any kind of pushback. I think that would, um, that, that probably would not be wise because, um, you know, they, they really promote joining these organizations because, um, you know, the, the different organizations go to Austin, they're registered lobbyists. And so they go up there and, um, you know, work toward what they say is in, in improving education. Um, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit because some of the things that I've seen over the past 20 years that I've been teaching, um, I just don't feel like those organizations have been as effective as they really need to be. There are a lot of things that, um, that none of us are really pleased with. 
and it's not just you know a, about the progressive <clears throat> values that kind of taken over the public school system but it's also the standardized testing that everyone complains about yet nothing seems to happen um and so it's that that still is a problem um the stagnant wages here in the state of texas we did just get um the biggest raise that i've ever gotten but it still doesn't put us in line with what real professionals make so when they call us professionals, I think they're really just kind of giving us lip service. Um, so we've got, you know, those issues. I mean, they're really, oh my goodness. And if you know anything about TRS active care, the, the health care that teachers are burdened with, that's one thing that just, um, and I'm not even under that. I, I'm, I'm blessed. My husband works at a plant and I get to be on his health insurance. But when I look at my colleagues and what they have to pay for health insurance mm. here in the state of Texas, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, when half of the the money that goes into education actually goes to fund people who are not teachers, um, you know, and, and we do need a lot of those people. We truly do. But it seems to be very, very top heavy. Um, and, you know, the we don't have the autonomy in the classroom that we really need. Now, I will say um, that. Now, I have to kind of brag on this this district that I'm in now because it's been very, very different. Um, I've had a lot more support and a lot more. Um, it, it's it's been a whole different ball game. I think that, and I'm not just saying that because I work there. I'm, you know, if I <laughs> if I was, I mean, I know it could come across that way, but if if I was at some of the other districts where I, I worked formally, where I really was happy. Um, I probably would just be a little more silent and I probably wouldn't share, but I've been very pleased with the respect that we get from our administrators, the support that we get from them. And I'll tell you one of the things, our students are really well behaved. The school that, that I just came from, it was, it was a little different. The kids could cuss you out and then they would, you know, the administrator would walk them back down and you know, say, Hey, you know, we need to get them back in the classroom. But where I am, um, you know, they don't they don't tolerate that if a kid cusses you out they'll send them to the alternative school for 30 days so those kids they just don't behave the same way they're held to a, a high standard and the kids live up to it well i mean a, a child just like an adult should be held to a standard I, I think we're failing our youth when we don't hold them to a basic standard but that word standard is, is such a ambiguous term it's almost because you mentioned standardized testing a, few, a little bit ago, and I, I think that system is kind of archaic. You know, we need to do a better job of that uh, because what happens is then, you know, if funding is based on what, you know, the success level of that test, if, you know, people's tenures attached to the success of that test, uh, like everyone forgets. Like I, I remember being a leader in the military uh, for very short period of time of my my life, uh, where you know I, as a leader, am responsible for everything that my unit did or failed to do. Right, the definition of leadership being the the art of influencing a unit or individual to accomplish a task by providing purpose, direction, and motivation. Uh, I can provide purpose, direction, and motivation. That doesn't mean like my knucklehead is actually going to do it. Right, so. The standardized testing, the STAR test, you know, like I get up at early every year when my kids are getting ready to do it. I make them a good breakfast. I give them a little pep talk, you know, like I make sure they go to bed early the night before, uh, you know, hoping that what they were actually supposed to take and learn in class through that, you know, previous semester is going to like play itself out on, on this test. Uh, is that the best reflection of success? I personally don't think so. Uh, I think is that how we base our funding system? Again, I disagree. Uh, what are the teachers' opinions of, like you mentioned it earlier, that's why I kind of wanted to circle back on it. Like, so we have a system that not everyone likes. The educators don't seem to like it. Uh, it doesn't present the results that we would all like, I guess. What's the answer? Is, is there a better system out there? Is there a philosophy? Is there a training program? Is there a, a venue that we can go to to get good results 
yet not have to deal with standardized testing? Well, I think one of the things that we need to do is give districts more control and not have um, near as much at the federal level and, and even limit more of what the state has. I think that we need to give teachers more autonomy to be able to take care of, of what they need to in the classroom because we're the ones that know our students. Um, but oftentimes we're told, you know, and when I say we, now understand I'm talking about all teachers. Um, we're told how to teach, what to teach, um, you know, and, and it's, um, it's just, it can be very controlling. And when it doesn't necessarily meet the, the needs of students, you have to understand what our classrooms look like now too, with inclusion classrooms. We have a, a broad range of abilities in classrooms. And so when teachers, you know, can't, when, when we don't have more control of our own classrooms to be able to meet the needs of those individual students, then, you know, it, it just doesn't work out near as well. So really, I believe it needs to be more local control. And when I say local, I really mean more classroom control. But, but, you know, testing, I don't think that testing is all evil. I remember when I was in school, however many years ago, um, I remember we would take a test at the end of the year and it was one test. It was like this achievement test that we would take and we, we didn't have all these testing tests over and over and over again throughout the year. Um, and, and I think that it's important, you know, to see how a student's doing, to see what their um, success has been and to measure it the next year, you know, to see if there's actual growth. Um, but to expect all students to, to be able to meet a certain standard um, it's it's really not fair because we have students that have all kinds of, of different abilities. So we need to be measuring well, growth. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I probably didn't communicate my point very well. The, the reason why I think the system is archaic is because when you have a, a test, this baseline will teach that baseline because they think that the success of their job the success, you know, and they forget that, like you said, students are individual, like, you know, some communities uh, have different focuses than other communities. Some communities are more event. The fact that I just met a 14 year old kid that could build something that my dad is, a, you know, when he was a tradesman, journeyman uh, would have taken pride in uh, is mind blowing. You know, that's what I'm saying, like different communities have different things, different environments yield different advantages. But, you know, we, we have to, like, not teach to a test. We need to teach to the students. We need to teach to their, their growth, as you would We need to teach to their advantage. Not like, well, we got to make sure that everybody gets this. And it's like, everybody will get that. But, like, our funding shouldn't be based on the percentage uh, of students in the district that do well in this. Uh, you know, keeping it real, you and I live in Texas. Uh, there is parts of Texas that uh, dip down deep into uh, what we would say if we went laterally, it would be mid-country of Mexico, right? Yeah. So if you're down like Harlingen or, you know, Brownsville or whatever, and you're looking at how deep you are down on the Gulf Coast there, and if you went parallel left uh, or to the west, as a person on a map would say, uh, you would find yourself in the heart of Mexico, right? That that's a different language, right? That that's a whole different culture. That's a whole different experience, and you know, they expect that child to have the same as if you were in the the Metroplex or if you were in Amarillo or Lubbock. It, it, that's unrealistic. Uh, you know, Texas is one fifth the the U.S. land mass, twenty percent. U.S. landman, the the lower 48 is within the borders of the greatest republic on earth. Yes. And yes, and that's you can't have a test that reflects all of that. It, it's just to me, it's I agree absolutely. What you said, you know, the autonomy of districts should be able to do. Shout out to your district because uh, you've said some great things about it. Uh, can we say where you're from? Can we say what district you represent? Oh, sure. I'm proud to be a Deer Park deer. Yeah. Deer Park. But hey, can I brag on you for a second too? On me? Not mm -hmm. only, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not only do you represent like, you know, your your district, you know, and your profession, 
you are one of the very first public educators to be appointed to a state council uh, on education. Uh, I, I don't know the guy very well, but I do like the guy very well. And uh, I'm talking about our governor, Greg mm -hmm. Abbott, the former you know, attorney general of Texas, now governor, wrecking things, doing right things. Uh, he saw fit, he personally appointed you uh, to that. Uh, how did that make you feel? You know, it's funny. I was with my husband the day I got the phone call from the governor's office letting me know that um, that he was wanting me to serve on that commission. And I, I was really just kind of shocked. And I, I don't think that I gave him the response that they were expecting because I was so shocked. But I was reaching over and just like shaking my husband, but trying to act all calm and cool on the phone. like. Oh, cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, but that, that was a, a whirlwind of a year. It was... Um, I spent a year going back and forth to Austin, which is about three and a half hours from my home. And I was there at least two times a month, um, sitting through a lot of meetings with a lot of politicians. And that was totally, I was out of my element. Um, you know, I got to sit on the commission next to my favorite Senator um, Paul Bettencourt. Um, I affectionately refer to him as Uncle Paul. But um, yeah, it was, it was very um, enlightening. And I think that, you know, m most public school teachers don't have an understanding of what the public school finance is all about. It was um, very much like trying to get um, a sip of water out of a fire hose. I was just, oh. because we don't get educated about what the, the finance system is about in public school. We just get allocated dollars. But I did learn, I learned a lot. I learned that on average, um, Texans spend about $300,000 per classroom. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, I do fuss a little bit about salary because the average teacher um, makes 60000 And so for a classroom to, you know, for, te for taxpayers to pay that much for, for one classroom, but yet a public school teacher only makes 60000 of that, um, it, it doesn't really seem... Um, Is that an addition? Is that 60000 in addition or that 60000 is encompassed within that 300000 uh, well, within the yeah, within the yeah. three hundred. Oh, so wow. so is it? You're saying three hundred thousand per taxpayer. So not so you know. No, no. no. So I'm saying taxpayers. No, per pay class. Per oh, for the price of the classroom. Gotcha. Classroom. gotcha. Yeah. Per classroom, they pay three hundred thousand dollars per classroom in the in the state. Where the teachers that, only worth sixty of that. Correct. That's that's on average. One, so the rest is facilities, administration costs, overhead. Well, and, and you know, there's maintenance, maintenance fees. right there's, facilities you know, yeah. there are a lot of other very important people in a district we have to have bus drivers and cafeteria ladies 20 percent i guarantee that teachers are worth more than 20 percent of the influence of that classroom well you know? uh, i'm not I like i'm sorry i'm canadian i'm like horrible with arithmetic yeah so you gotta pardon me but like that doesn't seem right. Well, what what also surprises me, if I jump in, if it real, is that you were the first, the only teacher to be appointed to the Texas for the Commission on Public School Finance. It seems like that would have been like a minimum number of teachers should have been on that to represent the ground truth. Absolutely. Right? Well, let me tell you, there were times that that uh, they probably uh, there were a couple of times they looked at me like, why is she here? Because I would. I, I sat very quietly most of the time, but I would get a bee in my bonnet. And um, like I, I remember during one of the meetings when they were talking about uh, what tax relief, property tax relief, had to do with education. And I, you know, got recognized and I, I went on a little rampage for a couple of minutes about how teachers are taxpayers too, and so are students. And, you know, housing is just a basic need. So I don't understand how you don't see the connection there. Um, yeah. Mm. So, Anyway, I occasionally, but Uncle Paul would uh, sometimes say things because he knew that that would kind of rile me up, and he, um, I think he enjoyed getting me to speak up every once in a while when I when I'd kind of lose my temper. So, do you think that's going to continue as a tradition? I don't know how long your term is or, or anything, but do you think it's going to um, they're going to try to keep at least a, a teacher, if not some representation, on on that commission? <laughs> That that commission was actually um, a temporary. That oh, was a special. Was? Mm -hmm, that oh. uh, well, and and the reason that they had that it was actually um, quite special because they formed the commission when we weren't even having a, a lawsuit, 
and they were trying to governor abbott and the the rest of congress they wanted to try to improve this system and so um that was even though it was temporary um we did some really cool stuff you know we got some some raises um and it mine this year it was 4.25 percent which is the largest raise i've ever gotten um you know so i mean typically there for a while teachers kind of raise um but it, that was the biggest that i've gotten in 20 years because wow. usually our raises are closer to two like two percent yeah yeah now you're also in the texas juvenile justice department you're a board member on there can you kind of let our listeners know and viewers know what it, what is that? I mean, from the name, I kind of got an idea, but I have no idea what it's about. What is that about, and and what do you do there? What is your well? I'm I'm also the teacher that serves on that board, and what what that board does is um, just kind of we're oversight to the the state schools, which you know, are the the prisons for the juveniles here in, in the state of Texas. There are five of those, um, and then we also um, you know oversee the the different, um, well, the different systems at the county level, um, you know, and and some of the programs that take place. I'm on the programs committee, also the finance committee. So, um, you know, and the programs committee has to do with the mental health, nutrition, education. So. Right. So dealing with the, the things that are affecting a lot of youth and, 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 you know, has been known to be the root cause of, of a lot of these horrible school shootings, that kind of stuff, right? It's, I mean, I think when I think of that, I think of the 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 Parkland shooting in Florida, where the the you know the young mm. like the guy was known to be an issue, you know he had been in trouble with the law, but you know because of whatever reason they kept just letting him come back to school. It seems like a, a juvenile justice department or some kind of commission like that would be they would be establishing the boundaries and the guidelines and and of how that's supposed to be handled. Is that kind of what you guys would do, things along that line. Well, the the. The locations that we take care of are are more um, when the students, well, the five state schools, those are the ones where um, they're actually being sentenced to prison. Okay. Um, yeah, and then once once they, you know, are released from there, and they either time out and have to go to a, an adult prison um, or they're released. And, you know, of course, unless they're under um, probation or a parole, then, um, you know, that's they don't fall under the system anymore. And, um, but the, from the things that I've seen, um, it, it looks like things are, are improving. I really like the programs that the state has implemented. Um, they're using the tex Texas model in the, those, um, those schools, um, and, and it, it seems to be working well. Instead of just housing the, the juveniles that have committed crimes, they're really trying to help re rehabilitate those juveniles. And... Um, I appreciate that they're doing that because, you know, those are kids. I work with kids every day and sometimes kids make very serious mistakes and, you know, they're the first ones that we need to be able to, you know, help to rehabilitate so that they can live a normal life and, and be safe for, you know, the, the rest of the citizens. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I really, I really appreciate the work that you do there. Uh, one of the, the things that my unit uh, adopted uh, this was years ago when I was still in, uh, was the, this is actually back in the late nineties when I was, uh, stationed at Fort Hood. Uh, you know, we worked at the San Saba school and we would go out to the San Saba or I can't actually remember what the, the actual terminology was, but it, it was one of the five, you know, uh, juvenile detention facilities for the state. And it was, uh, really powerful to, didn't hear some of those testimonies and it really kind of put things in perspective, but I appreciate that work because, you know, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, we have a responsibility to continue to educate uh, regardless of the time or regardless of the circumstance. If a kid's eight years old, he still or she still deserves the education that they would, uh, if they were in a different scenario, uh, like that's, that's what separates us from a lot of the other world, uh, part, a lot of the other countries in the world. That's why we're the bright shining city. Um, we, you know, like in the words of Nancy Reagan, you know, we leave no child behind, you know, like we do what we can to, to figure it out. But Troy, go ahead. Yeah. 
No problem. Well, hey, Melissa, I just want to, um, we don't want to keep you anymore. You've given us uh, almost an hour tonight, and I want to really thank you for, for uh, one, giving us another chance. We had technical issues before, but thanks for coming on, sharing your story, sharing uh, the impact you're having. Not only have you served this country, uh, you know, in the Air Force uh, as, a, as a diesel mechanic, uh, not what I would have guessed. I wanted to get into that, too, and find out, what happened. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm like, what your vocational skills were before that or the air force like we got a job for you you'll love it um but you continue to serve your community you've done it for over 20 years and not just teaching which is admirable in itself and, and educating our youth uh but also serving on these commissions being recognized being appointed there i mean obviously you have a you have a voice and and you've earned and respect and that is known otherwise you would not have been given these opportunities and i think it's phenomenal that you continue to give back that's a selfless service we love to highlight on this show Oh, well, thank you. Well, hey, I want to interrupt for just a second because one of the things that I'm most proud of is I have a I have a son and a daughter. My son's 25, but my daughter, can I introduce y'all to her real quick? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Come on. Come here, Bailey. She's she's just got home from piano lessons, but cameo is, appearance. Yeah, this is Bailey. I wanted y'all to meet her because um she last year started a chapter of the Teenage Republicans on her campus. And so, oh, here we go. Yeah, so she's a bit of an activist. But, um, and she actually, on March 23rd, um, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West is coming to speak to her chapter. Um, yeah, and they, they've been invited. They're going to be pages at the Texas Republican Convention. And, yeah, they've got a lot going on. Wow. How cool is that? Man. Well, Colonel West, uh, we're fans of him here. He's a... Uh... He's a great guy, you know, like, even though he's field artillery and not, you know, infantry. But he is a jump but, master. Uh, he is a jump master, so I give him but that. He does, he does have that little insignia. The, uh, no, like, that's very impressive. So is this, uh, is this chapter how, in high school? Because you look like you're in high school. You don't look like you're in college. Okay. I was like, there's no way you're in college. <laughs> yeah, she's a, she's a junior. She's in 11th grade, but I've, I've tried to raise her. Oh, my daughter. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that that yeah. apple did not fall far from the tree. She's not like making political statements. I love it, Bailey. Uh, how how is uh, uh, the teenage Republican being uh, received by your student body? Um, I mean, it's not as uh, it's being received better than I thought it would. Be. I mean, there's not as much um, I guess, slack against us as we expected. But um, there are still some things said in some classes sometimes. Uh, well, you are interesting you say that. You are in Texas, so that helps. That? But you know, why, why would you expect um, friction? Um, I mean, because of high school and a lot of kids my age don't, just don't realize um, how... They just don't realize what's best for them, I guess. <laughs> and um, definitely a lot of kids, even in the conservative area where we live, um, are a lot more liberal. Because they're, they're following along with what they're kind of hearing and, and, you know, what their favorite musician or actor or just somebody says. They're, they're not really forming their own opinions, it sounds like. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, well you know, like... That, that's kind of a bummer, you know, to use a, a term that, you know, a certain junior in my household likes to say, uh, because, like, this is the time where you should be, you know, thinking about it for yourself, right? And, uh, like, I'm proud of you, like, because really, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the fence or the aisle, you, if you were bringing politics and you fall under, is that you've developed this, you've you've thought this through and you're doing this and you're standing up and you know, like you have a group of fellowship to support it. So good on you, Bailey, like proud Thank to meet you. I love it. Oh, you know, like that's it, awesome. And, and not, she has, there's, there's posters hanging up in her high school where she's posing. She's got like the full outfit on and she's posing like Rosie the Riveter. It's huge posters. Yeah. It says, we yes, can do it. we so can. Yeah. It says we can. But Republican and and nobody's torn them down. So yeah, and they've been up for two years now. So well, I live I live here in New York. Be glad you're there and you're doing it there. I don't think you would have got such, get such a warm re reception up here. So 
it, and we we got a listener note the chat saying better than being in Illinois where he's at too. So uh, yeah, definitely <laughs> the Republic of Tejas is definitely definitely helps out. But like I say, not everyone you know. There's people of all kind of walks and size, but uh, that's awesome though. It's great because Bailey, I like it because great. you are making your own decision. Like Toby said, you're you're at that age where uh, you are forming your own opinion. You're getting educated. You're not just being influenced or told what to do. You're making up your own mind and, and deciding which way you want to go. And that's awesome. That's what we need in the country. I love it. I have a little bit of an influence. Just a little bit. Just a little uh, bit. Not... <laughs> good work, Bailey. We're proud of you. Yeah. Thanks. But uh, well, awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for the the surprise cameo appearance. We appreciate that, and Toby. I think this is our first mother daughter uh, guest we've ever had it on the is, show. It is. Uh, it's in, awesome. In all I love these it. years we've been doing That'd it, be but good. Yeah. See, look at that, uh, Melissa. You're just breaking. You're you're breaking ground all over the place there. You're just uh, the, the first in many. But uh, again, thank you so much. Um, thank you for giving us some of your Thursday night and coming on and joining us and 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 talking to us and and educating us and kind of what's going on out there. Uh, not only those in the state of Texas, but all of us, all of our listeners and viewers all over the all over the globe on kind of the, some of the efforts you have going on. Hopefully, someone will pick this up and maybe want to start an association like that in their area or realize that there's others. You know, there's other there's a there's a precedence that's been set. So that's cool. Well, we definitely need people to join the Innovative Teachers of Texas. We need that voice to just become louder and stronger. Awesome. Okay. And that's, and that's in our chat room, uh, Innovative Teachers of Texas, ITTTexas.org, tech, it uh, wonderful nonprofit, uh, talking about traditional Texas values for educators. Uh, go look it up. Yep. Awesome. Well, hey, we're gonna let you. We're gonna let you go, Melissa. You guys can go ahead and hang up and uh, and want to wish you a good night. And we'll stay in touch when something happens or changes or you got any major updates. Please reach out. And let us know. We'd love to have you back on and and talk about those. Okay, great. Keep up right. good work, man. Yes, keep thank it up, you. both both of you guys. Thank you guys very much. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, everyone. There we go. And uh, wow, that's uh, that's it, man. We have. Uh, Mother, what a great, what a, what an inspiring young lady and made posters like Rosie the Riveter. Dude. So like, I gotta tell you, like, that is absolutely why I love America. This is why, like, so what we just witnessed, you know, and I know like, you know, people are tuning in, tuning out, but I gotta tell you that what just happened 10 minutes ago is exactly why I am in this country why I remain in this country, why I love this country, why I fought for this country is because I love the fact that I cannot imagine living without the right, the freedom of speech and expression. And that young lady, that little Bailey, that junior in high school out there, you know, forming her own political opinion, speaking out, and 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 this isn't because she's uh, a Republican, but if you're getting on that horse right now, go ahead and like. I hope it bucks you off, because this is about a child becoming an adult. I have the age group 16 through 18, where you're having to make major decisions. We're trusting you at 18 to make the decision on paper and for the record for the presidency and the leadership of the free world. We're trusting you with that civic duty. And here this young woman is embracing that and like getting out there and educating herself, being passionate about it. And again, this isn't about party. This isn't about anything. I would say the same thing if they were mobilizing for a different party. Biggest I thing is love, someone that makes up their I, mind and just doesn't do it because the pop singer so and so or whatever does it right. It's you know yeah. if they can if they can have a it's, if they can have a, a civil not. discussion, argue their points, yeah. express their opinion and why it's why they think it's the right thing. That's what we want, right? And and we're talking about the Bill of Rights. We're talking about the very first thing, the most important thing. Our founding fathers, more than anything, wanted this right here, is for us to be able. to to voice our opinions, make posters, publish them, put them out there. Be respectful. Act, be civil. And buy our beliefs, our right. convictions. I love it. You know, I've never, like, everything that happened before that in the interview was great. 
you know, Melissa is a wonderful person. She's extremely accomplished. I love everything that she's doing. But like that little bit at the end with her daughter was phenomenal. And like, I hope people really don't miss out on that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, man, let's jump on a couple of the topics while we got a few minutes left here. Um, uh, for those that are tuning in late, we just had Melissa Martin on. Definitely go back and watch the show. Um, and uh, but man, there's a uh, it's been crazy. I don't know if you've been watching Toby, but you know, obviously, you know the the Republicans in the White House. You know, in the White House, he's the incumbent. Um, so it's all about the others trying to run against him. We we've, we talked months ago. We talked when there was twenty something people or something about how they were just going to eat each other up, attack each other. And it was going to be hard for them to uh, to really the Democrats, you know, they were going to go so far. We saw them going so far left uh, that how were they going to bring it back to the middle when it came to the general election to try to win over independence. Right. Which is and and I don't know if you watched the last couple um, uh, uh, debates, but I mean, the one the other night, it is just it's savagery. They are not, um, they're not talking, the last two debates in Nevada and South Carolina, they're not talking substance, they're not talking immigration, they're not talking health care, except for just complaining about one guy's cost of what he wants to do, but they're not able to even present, the other night, they weren't even able to, to express their, uh, their foundation or their principles, it was just screaming over the top of each other. It is really turning into a dumpster fire. I mean... Yeah, I, you know, part of me... Didn't even want you to bring it up uh, because <laughs> you should, have, should have told me that beforehand. No, no, I probably should have. But here's the reality: the world is watching us, you know, and it's hard to believe. But outside the the geographical capacity of America is this other thing called the world, and they look to us as the bright shining hill. They look to us for leadership. They look to us because we're the successful ones. Uh, you know, ones with political system, you know, that took this hybrid of what Thomas Locke and Hobbes and, you know, and put it all together. Our founding fathers, like, put, laid out these things that we're just talking about with the Bill of Rights. And, you know, we created this, this beautiful thing. And people look to us. And what we're showing them right now is not an actual reflection of what America is. And now people are going to be like, oh, well, Trump's not the reflection of what America is. Well, you're right. Trump is not because uh, he's a person within the hundreds of millions of people within America. But what we're seeing now, we're seeing – this group of people in the public descend in the spiraling vertigo of madness. And, and, and it is like Robin, you know, talks about it being a black hole and it collapsing upon itself. Like it is not flattering. It's not what we need. We're not talking about substantive issues, uh, substance, substantive issues and i'm like struggling with english language tonight the uh, it's embarrassing and i look at like i i was watching uh the news i i was on a mountaintop chasing you know sheep for the past you know a little bit so like i've been in without signal and kind of in a cave and i get back to reality earlier you know today and all of a sudden i'm learning about shootings and I'm learning about all kinds of different things. I'm, le I'm watching debate highlights and I'm watching commercials. And one of the commercials was by vote vets. Oh vote Lord. Vets. Oh my Lord. We've, we've talked about vote vets before, you know, they're like, they are self-proclaimed, you know, democratic socialist party pack. And they're like promoting Buttigieg. You know, like, I, I'm watching these different things. It's like, we can't even have substantive conversations about anything. We got these packs coming in and, like, pushing. And, and it's, holy crap. Like Not, not even, not even Gabby. Not even uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Fire. Beauty of a dumpster fire is you could take the lid and you can flip it back and, you know, suffocate it of oxygen. Like, 
What's happening now, when you watch one of these debates, they're not just suffocating each other of oxygen, they're suffocating the entire freaking country. I've never seen some oxygen thieves like get after right now. Like that, that's armed robbery. That's aggravated like oxygen assault because <laughs> like they're just like yeah. And, and then of course you like you no, know, I love Tulsi. Yeah, I've said it here a hundred times. You know, know, like, but they're doing her dirty. Yeah, they, they, the well, the field is whittled down. They're doing everybody. Right, the field is whittled down. Right, I could see when they when they had their their stipulations of who got in, who didn't get in before, because they had too many to put on a stage. But now they're down to six or seven or eight or whatever. They have enough room to just let them out on the stage and let them go after it. Right, there's there. Yeah, and, so she's and, not getting in because she's doing Hillary. Like, right. Let Let's not. She's suing the. She's essentially suing the establishment. Right? Yeah. And uh, Tulsi stood up to the establishment, and they're trying to like burn her out. Like, let's. Let's not like pull punches. Like it is what it is. And I hope, you know, she's got like a great, you know, um, life insurance policy. And I hope she like leaves a letter that says I did not kill myself. Yes. Yes. Because like it's coming. No, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. She's, uh, um, uh, speaking of suicides. Yeah. Speaking of suicide. So Harvey Weinstein, uh, uh, was was recently um convicted and um and boy had to go to the hospital first i thought that was it when they said he, i saw the news look that he's going to hospital like, i'm like wow she didn't even let him get in a prison garb first and he's already no. being taken out i'm like you know i just you know i just see this this ambulance this ambulance driver in the back pull back a mask and it's her with a big needle with you know cyanide in it or something and i was like geez man can't even let him like get his first prison meal before you take him out but Obviously, he was just having probably some heart palpitations, realizing that he was going into prison and never going to see daylight again. How mighty or how big the mighty have fallen to be from pretty much the kingmaker of Hollywood uh, who went, you know, un unmolested, pardon a pun, uh, for years to do whatever he wanted to do. He became the butt of the jokes and pretty much was the reason of all the stereotype, you know, uh, the way to Hollywood's off on the casting couch kind of jokes and mindset. He was the reason behind that to now um, yeah. being sentenced to prison in New York. And oh, by the way, as soon as that sentence is done, then he's got to get carted off across the country to California to face charges there. Uh, you know, this is just the first of many. Um, but I mean, what, if anything, it just, there's nobody that's too big to fail. There's no one above the law. I mean, if anyone could buy their way out, if, especially if you look at the amount of money he donated to politicians, especially the Hillary campaign, there's no amount of money that you can spend and not get in trouble. It's kind of like there's no amount of money you can spend and guarantee yourself to become a president because obviously we're seeing Bloomberg not doing that either. I just jumped. I, I jumped. To, I know I jumped a lot of topics there. No, no like uh, <laughs> in our internal group chat earlier, that one meme, you know, like just me over here minding my business and then, you know, like a trumpet horn in the face, like, you know, Bloomberg, Bloomberg ends. yeah, letting him know that he's running for president. Yes, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, that dude, like that dude's buying up airtime. That dude's doing all these different things. Ran it, ran know, a commercial honestly, during the he ran a commercial during the debate the other night. That's freaking. That's pretty savage. I mean that that's a troll. That's a troll level for yeah. sure. Um, but again, not helping. Uh. No, people see yeah, through it. He, In fact, the debates, his, the debates show the true self. On the stage, has not been good. You know, while his executive, you know, chops are are fitting, they're appropriate. Uh, again, he, he, here's the thing: we're talking about Donald Trump. Uh, one of the, I I gotta say probably the best debater I've ever met, seen or witnessed, or ever thought I would ever see or witness in my entire lifetime was a a fine Republican out of the state of Texas named Ted Cruz. Uh, on a debate platform, I don't know if there's anyone better than him. Uh, an astute, you know, appellate lawyer, you know, like dude's amazing when it comes to actually debating hard cold facts dude's just 
intelligent, nice with his communication, unbelievable debater. Donald Trump, the amateur, first time rodeo, eviscerated him. Jeb Bush eviscerated him. Uh, Chris Christie. The, Chris Christie. Well, yeah, you you could. He definitely eviscerated him. I don't, I don't think Chris Christie has like the Marco Rubio chops or anything like right. that. You know, like uh, you're gonna have to go against him, and you couldn't go against. Elizabeth Warren, and you, you think that you're going to be able to go against Donald Trump in a debate? Well, I think that's why in the Democratic the- base, like Carville and so many, are freaking out because they they're saying that 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 if Sanders wins, they're done. They don't have a chance. I mean, the other night, but the other night he had people boo. They had people the other night boo that that Cuba was bad or Cuba was Cuba was good, and he lost his like he lost all composure. You know, started pounding right. the podium. But- like it it doesn't matter like that's the point i'm trying to make is like they are trying to put mayor pete elizabeth warren bloomberg biden ernie up against trump who eviscerated people that they can't hold a candle to right i mean marco rubio how do any of them Marco Rubio, like, come on. Yeah. Like, when your competition's Beto O'Rourke, you know, like, let's keep it real. Or, or, when, uh, or, 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 or Cory Booker. Booker. Yeah. You know, when, you, and when you're saying, like, oh, well, you know, I survived, like, being up against Cory Booker or Beto O'Rourke, like, that, that's not an accomplishment. I don't know what your thing like, take. I want to ask you real quick. I don't know what your take is. From all the ones that have been running, you know who I kind of thought Cruz was the best debater? Be, Cruz didn't even campaign against Ben. Right. And won. You know, I, I think, I think honestly, I know she didn't do well. She dropped out because people just didn't like her and didn't trust her. But I think Kamala Harris was probably one of the best debaters that has that was on this Democratic run. Oh, sure. She really has great composure. I mean, Elizabeth Warren comes off as, as psycho crazy cat lady about... 10 minutes into whatever spiel she's into if that far but um but really kamala harris really has composure and she oh, seems articulate uh, she just couldn't win people over people just didn't like what they saw i mean they just well, like, a- absolutely and and the problem is like everyone's concerned about like what whether she's gargling like bong water or something else but you know tulsi gabbard has those chops but they're not yeah. going to give her the chance right right you know yeah. like tulsi gabbard has the the composure, she has the intellect, yeah. she has the like actual foundation and factual ability yeah. to discuss things. I might not agree with all her policies, um, but like she has the ability to do it. But no, like you're gonna you're gonna put you know Mayor Pete up against Donald Trump. Mayor Pete can't even make it out of drinking, bro. You know, they, they got the pictures of him like fake holding his weapon with his blank vest and every vet in the country is like going against him except vote vets that which i think is funny because that just shows that vote vets is like a fake organization bro we've but, always known them to be that they're they're an absolute we've always known that. yeah they're but, an absolute joke when you said that word like, i just cringed Elizabeth warren is going to try and like debate donald trump like i i I got money that says it, it doesn't take three minutes for Pocahontas to come out of his mouth. Oh, I, I would give it three seconds. I mean, I can't believe the others haven't used some of her DNA stuff. And well, that's, that's, that, that's, in, that's internal, like, fund sharing, right? Like, right. you know, they're not trying to bite the hand because they need the party's money, you know, because the party's dividing the money up. But, like, there isn't a person that they can put out that can debate Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is an amateur Yet he eviscerated Ted Cruz, right? Ted Bush, yes. Uh, well, t- t- let's t- look if you want the executives, let's just look at the executives that he he like smacked down. But if you want to highlight uh, how and ha- how much better he's gotten since then, and and what a, what a debater he is, he's the first one. And I wonder if he's going to set the precedent. If this is the way it's going to be from here on out, every one of these uh, primaries and every one of these. Um, uh, uh, debates that happen what does he do he's in there the day before he does a can't he doesn't have to he's cleaning i mean he's got the republican ticket but the day before nevada he's in there 
the day before uh you know new hampshire he's in there and he's doing these massive tens of thousands of people rallies why pretty much pre-trolling them just be like oh that's great that you've got this little debate i'm coming in packing a house oh oh yeah people are outside 10 degrees in colorado sleeping out to get into my to get into my thing i'm gonna come in for for 30 minutes and be out and i mean that's that's at the level he's at he he's not even gotten them to show up on the same stage with him yet and he's tearing them up before they before they can even get them. Yeah. no like uh like i said earlier you know he is absolutely i mean my children sorry let me correct myself my grandchildren are going to study donald trump's re-election campaign 2020 campaign in school if my kids do anything in the realm of american history or learn anything in the realm of the political sciences they will study Trump's 2020 campaign and not because of some collusion not because of co some conspiracy not because some textbook is like you know biased and saying like you know propagating some bullshit uh you're gonna study it because he he is annihilating people and it's it's crazy I, I will also say that I found it extremely interesting that he is suing the New York Times for libel um uh for for i'm sure it's probably in the legal brief but for fake news yeah. uh you know like for using you know an editorial opportunity to like spread misinformation to influence an election which uh, is exactly what they're doing uh which is exactly what a lot of networks are doing what a lot of publications are doing and and have for a long period of time all right, let me make sure I put that in. This is not a new thing. Right. You know, my caveat here is this is not a new thing, but if they're going to come at him for the whole Russian collusion thing, then they're doing it too. And, you know, like, this, the winners out of all this is absolutely our enemies because our enemies are taking these debates, they're taking these sound bites, they're taking these opportunities to show how, like, dysfunctional part of our country is like if you watch the state of the union you'll watch and if you listen to the facts you can fact check it all you want you listen and watch the state of the union you take the information that's displayed you put it against whatever fact checker you want and you're like holy shit america's a badass location and gots to get there right you want a democratic presidential debate and you're like, I should probably suck start a shotgun in about five seconds. Three, two, because, like, you're not doing it right. We should not be, we should not let us represent ourselves so poorly. That's all I got. No, That's no, all I'm, got. I'm with you. Yeah, it's, uh, um, they definitely, it's interesting as I watch this, I just want to mention, you know, we, we went through, we started with what, Russian collusion and, and this in Ukraine and hoax. We had Michael Caputo on a couple of weeks ago, you know, talking about that. We've had, you know, then we went into the, the Ukraine thing and, and the phone call and, and the Mueller report and the so on and so forth. And now, right. They, they've spent every card they got and now it's, Oh, it's a coronavirus, And now they're just in the last 24 hours piling on that, uh, uh, you know, their, their buzzword, they were all told to use is anemic, right? So queen Pelosi told them anemic oh. and now, now they're all using anemic. And uh, it's all about uh, it's all about the reaction to the coronavirus. So just to be clear, so people know, I know we we only react to what's thrown at us in the media, and everyone just believes what they hear. That's how propaganda starts uh, and happens. You know, we lose more people per year in the United States to flu, uh, like a ton, like a lot more than have been that have died in the, in the coronavirus. And yes, the coronavirus is bad. But when you look at the amount it's infected, right, they've, they've, they've determined now the CDC has said it's not near as severe as we thought. It's really only affecting the elderly. It's not even really affecting kids. It's affecting elderly and 2%, those with asthma. 2%. Right. Asthma, effect, which is more than uh, uh, yeah, the flu affects people a lot more than that. So it's bad, but it gets all the press and people are buying up masks and they're doing this. But the reality is, you know, if you are, um, 
you know, if, if it's a thing, it's going to spread. The flu spreads all the time. The cold spreads all the time. Nobody, you know, it's not a big deal. So that's now what they attack them on. We'll see where it goes, but it's going to go where everywhere else does. And that's going to go nowhere. But, you know, hey, they're reacting to it. Um, just do your proper thing. Wash your hands. Uh, don't cough on people. Cover your mouth. Just be civil and be polite and do what you're supposed to do. And it's going to be okay. You know, just that's, that's all there is to it. So just don't fall into the panic. It's not three days to anarchy. You don't have to stop buying, start buying milk and bread and freaking out. Just just deal with it and, and go on. Stay yeah. on cruise ships too. But anyways, we got to close. Uh, it is yeah. Yeah. It's 918 uh, here in the East Coast, 818 Central. We've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. I want to thank our guests, uh, Melissa Martin on for tonight. Um, she was a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal guest we had on. She is... Uh, she is her and her daughter both actually to put it to be fair um for the, the cameo that we got uh, um and uh great great things learned about the about teachers and schools and what they get paid and all that thank you for um all of our listeners and viewers we saw a lot of people coming and going uh toby it was great to hanging out with you uh tonight on the show we're going to be hanging out in a couple weeks together um i guess we should go and tell ended. people yeah, so um, we'll be back next week. We've got a great show lined up. The week after, we're not going to be doing a show on March 12th. We're telling you now, two weeks out, we'll be doing a show on March 9th. And uh, we may be together, as in that that means we will be. Um, so we're going to do a show on March. We did a couple weeks ago on a special Monday night show. I'm telling you now, if you're listening, we're doing it again on a Monday night, March 9th, uh, from the Southern Studio. Uh, so we'll not be doing a show on March 12th. Put on your calendars, ch- adjust them, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your people you don't like. We don't care. Uh, invite them to the show. We got some great guests lined up, as always. Thanks to Rob, our unpaid producer, uh, and Listed 9 Fight Company, Veteran Outdoors, Boohammer.com, and all of our great sponsors, uh, Gear for Grunts. And thank all of you, and thank you, Toby, for everyone spending some time with us tonight. How's that sound? Are we, sound good? Are we good to go? All right, so let me find my... Uh, Trying to find my right music here, and oh my lord, here we go! Yeah. All right, all right, everybody, thank you so much. Everyone, have a good night, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Stew in the Men Radio. We hope you enjoyed your time with us because we have enjoyed sharing our time with you. Be sure to check out stewingthenun.com in addition to asking us questions and interacting with us on our Facebook page and Twitter. We look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern here on Spreaker and Facebook Live. Also, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Warrior Media Solutions, Poohammer.com, Veteran Outdoors, Graybeard Publishing, and Mighty Oaks Warrior Foundation. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Thank you again and have a good night.